Our prospect model, the UN score, is prepping for its post-draft launch, but the discussion is already flowing, so we're going to dig in. Let's get it. Pulling apart the fantasy football fabric one thread at a time, you are back with Unravel, baby. Trav here, hosting and West Coasting. I am coming correct, as always, from the Undroppables YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe, like, and leave a comment. That is the best way to show some love over on the tube. And make sure you go follow us on social media at the Undroppables on Instagram, Twitter, or X, whichever you prefer, and uh, TikTok. TikTok as well. So some good stuff happening for the team. We've got a lot of fun stuff. The Patreon is bumping. The socials are bumping. The YouTube is bumping. We're happy with all of it. And joining me tonight is one of my dear friends from the Undroppables, a absolute rocket ship as far as the fantasy industry goes, in my opinion. This is Dan Wisner, also goes by Wiz. You can find him on X at the Wiz underscore FFB. Also, I might add, one half of the Double Dan show, which is actually Patriots Uncovered. Really good Patriots coverage coming to the YouTube channel as well. So, Dan, I can't really call you Dan, though. I kind of have to call you Wiz at this point. How are you doing, my brother? What's up, man? What's up? I'm super excited to uh, to join you. I know you and I have been talking about doing one of these for a while now. So um, this is more than an appropriate subject to do that. And I uh, couldn't be more excited to kind of join you tonight. Uh, for anybody out there that doesn't know me after that kind intro, intro from Trav there, um, looking forward to talking through some of the model stuff that you guys may have heard of the on on the undrafted so far. Um, and yeah, Trav, ready to get into it, man. Stoked, man. Yeah, much like the stars, our schedules aligned for this show tonight, Wiz, and I could not be more stoked. I do want to give a quick shout out. I did mention the Patri Patriots show is there as well. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the rest of the Uncovered series. I think we're up to six teams on boarded now. And what that is, is that's a little bit of a deviation from the fantasy content on the Undroppables platform. That's where you can hear all the latest about your favorite team. So we're working to, to onboard all 32. We've got six on board already and the content is moving. It is all top notch. I can say that because I'm editing some of the video work and stuff and Everybody is putting in really good work. So we've got Chiefs, Patriots, where you can find Wiz and also Dan, AWL, one of our faves. Uh, we've got Raiders. We've got, um, oh man, I'm blowing it here. We've got uh, Broncos should be out by the time this podcast airs. And then we've got Cardinals and Commanders coming on. So it's really good. There's lots of, lots of awesome, awesome content. If one of those is your team. Make sure you subscribe to that YouTube channel. If you're interested in contributing to the team to provide content about your favorite team, feel free to reach out as well. There's a pinned tweet on our uh, our Twitter account and you can get access to sending through an application for that because that'd be sweet. We want to build up all 32 and this thing is growing fast. Okay, Wiz, enough of my yapping. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the model tonight. Uh, and for our viewers, I'm not talking about the devilish good looks that you're seeing on screen here. I'm talking about the <laughs> Undroppables new prospect model, the UN score. Wiz, you actually alluded to it last week. You got to go on the Undrafted podcast with Jax Falcone, absolute beaut. You guys took a look at a bunch of the players and the percentiles in which they fell, kind of talked about what their outlooks might be looking like. Today, we're going to take a little bit of a different spin on the model. Um, we're just trying to uncover a little bit of information to give those who are asking us questions about it a little bit more as we move towards the launch, of course. And we're going to look at some of the thresholds within the model, Wiz. We're going to talk about some of their hit rates, going to talk about some of the players within those ranges of the model. So it's going to be really, really fun. We're going to talk about how you should use the model for your fantasy football process. And we might answer a uh, Patreon question or two, which is going to be really fun, Wiz. So are you fired up or what? I'm dude, I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, dude. It's been good. We did a little planning sesh for this episode to make sure we absolutely nailed it. So hope you all enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate it. But yeah, we've been dropping teasers on x.com. So make sure you're following us there. Some graphics made by that man, Fantasy Dukes, uh, showing some scores for some of these buzzy players, sparking some discussion around it. Uh, and it's been good. People are really stoked, Wiz. We're getting some really good questions, really thoughtful stuff, and people just trying to yeah. understand a little bit more. It's totally understandable. This is a new thing coming out of the Undroppables platform that people might not be used to. So I think it's 
really fun that we're getting uh, getting in the lab to talk about it here, Wiz. Um, Absolutely. So I want to touch on here just how people can access it because I know people are ac are asking about it. Um, it's not available just yet. We are leading up to the launch and that's going to happen post-draft. So all of these scores that we're talking about here tonight are post-draft capital. I think that's really important to note um, because all of these include the draft capital that was assigned to these players. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through as well. But make sure you're in that Patreon. If you haven't signed up yet, go check it out. That's the best way to keep tabs on all of this releasing and we may or may not have dropped an exclusive top 12 of the 2023 draft class in there just today so some good stuff happening and the patrons are excited so wiz just want to talk a little bit about the groundwork here and how the model came to be um what the development process might have looked like for all of you guys i wasn't really involved that much in that that part i know you guys it was a labor of love you guys were in the dungeons going hard you were <laughs> building databases jay yeah uh, fantasy football coder shout out as well uh he was in there pushing code i don't know what the wording is for that so i'm sorry if i didn't do what you did justice jay that's good enough um, but Wiz, why don't you tell us when, what went into it um, and maybe how you guys came together and if there's any like favorite stats that are in that model that you'd like to talk about. Yeah, absolutely, Trav. So I think it's a really good place to start, right? So um, I came on to the Andropoles, you know, kind of you know about the end of December-ish, right? And one of the first things that, you know, I had been talking to Jackson Chalk about was kind of thinking about the future of, you know, the Undroppables and what we can bring to the table for, you know, listeners and patrons and stuff like that alike, right? And I think one of the things that, you know, Undroppables has done a really nice job of, you know, me being a fan of them before I came onto the team um, is really, you know, diving in and, and having that really nice dynasty perspective, right? So we wanted to think about how we can take that a step further. Uh, and the first thing that we kind of landed on was like, all right, like, let's start looking at a prospect model. Um, so long story short, we uh, we started building out some of the database stuff like kind of that you alluded to earlier um, and really just trying to trying to wrap our hands around. All right. What what do we have to get together to start to go into this? Right. Um, and then, you know, that's when Chalk mentioned that he was going to be bringing on FF Coder. And that's kind of where the game changed sort of us, so to speak. Um, you know, Coder has been for anybody that doesn't know him or anybody that doesn't follow him on Twitter. Do absolutely go do that. Uh, super insightful guy that has just been an absolute backbone of, you know, this whole project. Um, and so in working with him, just really kind of understanding, you know, what the foundation looks like for building something like this, uh, because this is the first time that I've kind of gone through like a real, real model, right? Like not just something that is whipped up in Excel and, you know, you hit a regression model button or something like that, right? Like this is, this is something that, you know, we wrote, it's, it's been written in JavaScript um, and the, the ability that that gave us to run through some correlations uh, was super, super exciting, Trav, right? So we kind of started there um, and that was, you know, right after the new year and we were in testing for, you know, let's call it a month. And that, that led to a lot of back and forths, a lot of late night video chats, uh, like, you know, just a lot of conversation between, you know, Coder, myself, Chalk and Jax. And, you know, we kind of landed on some of the stuff that we'll speak on here in this model uh, in a bit here, but we're really excited with kind of how it's turned out and how it's gotten to this point. I think the labor of love term is, is pretty appropriate for kind of what's gone into it. But, you know, to your point, I think us releasing it, Duke's having these graphics, it's really driven some awesome conversations and some really nice questions from people reaching out, asking what's in it. Um, you know, Coder and myself are going to be working on a white paper of sorts uh, that will be, you know, released in conjunction once we kind of go through the 2024 draft process and everything's released here. But yeah, man, it's it's been a really busy last couple months and and now it's exciting to kind of share what we've been working on here. Yeah, man, as kind of a spectator on those group chats and stuff, I can confirm all of that that you said that you guys have been going really hard in there. And definitely like all the good discussion around it is as the guy who runs the undroppable socials in the YouTube channel, it's bumping and uh, I appreciate it. It's really good. It's good to see some eyes coming on the brand and some people seeing the hard work that you guys are putting in. So I really, I really like what you guys have done with it. And uh, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but just the way that you guys are kind of explaining it when there's people asking questions on Twitter and things like that, it's uh, it's really cool to see it actually unfold and come to life, man. So um, yeah, just big shout out to all four of you guys for getting in, in the nitty gritty. And uh, we're going to try and get Jay on some sort of podcast at some point soon as well. Absolutely. Uh, and then of course, if you want to see Jax, go follow the Undrafted Fantasy Football Podcast records weekly 
Um, and then Big Chalk Daddy, you always know where he's at. He shows up on the fucking undrafted show from time to time. You never know. Um, love, love this team and what we're doing. So, Wiz, I want to talk a little bit just before we start to get into these thresholds that I was talking about and the players within them. I want to just kind of talk about how we suggest the model should be used and how people should be using it because um, we're not coming out here and saying that you should take this as the Bible. Um, yep. We aren't saying that this is a silver bullet for you winning millions of dollars in fantasy football. But what we are saying is that this is a, a nice guide for you to take a look and maybe discern between some similar prospects. Right. And I think it's really good for us to talk about how it should be used because from my maybe non data, uh, not as deep into the data world as you guys are, um, as I'm looking at it, it looks a little bit different than some of the scales that we might have seen before, Wiz, where you're seeing, you know, guys in the 80s is what you're looking for. On the U for the UN score, there's guys scoring in the 60s that are still in kind of the upper percentiles of the model. And that's some of what you and Jax were talking about last week. Um, but like I said, it's not intended to be that silver bullet. One thing that I always say, um, kind of on the True North platform there, Wiz, is that I want to inform, empower, and entertain listeners towards making sound fantasy decisions. And that's kind of what yeah. this does, right? We are informing you and equipping you with a tool, and we want you to feel like you can make those sound decisions for yourself. We will give you advice. We will give you our opinions. But this is just another tool, and in my opinion, a next level one. To help guide you towards that right so that's kind of my um my thoughts on what the tool is or what the score is for um and then when we look at some of the thresholds here i kind of see it as uh, my term that i put on it in my notes was kind of like a scale of certainty whiz um so mm -hmm. when we're getting that at those guys near the top we're pretty certain that those are going to be hits and we're going to talk about that when we get a little bit lower, maybe a tier below, we're still very confident, but that's where we start to bring our other process into play, the context around these guys. Um, and then as we get a little bit lower um, into some of the other guys that we're going to talk about tonight, that's where you really want to dig your heels in a little bit and maybe spend a little bit more time in the research and checking all the context around that player. So that's kind of how I see it. But I really, like I said, like that's kind of my rudimentary under, like understanding or explanation. Um, but I want you to kind of confirm whether that's how it should be um, kind of thought of for people or is there a little bit of difference, different nuance in there? No, I mean, Trev, I think you did a nice job of kind of covering that, right? Because one of the things that Jax and I did discuss on the pod, and and again, want to make this for, you know, for anybody that might have missed that, right? If I make some references here and there, I just, I want to make this very clear as well as, you know, while we go through our fantasy decision making, whether it's, you know, I'm, you're strictly a film guy, or, you know, you're strictly an analytics guy, or maybe you're a combination of both, right? Um, or, you know, whether it's you're, you're factoring in some of the, the social activity that, you're, that we've seen leading up to the draft here, or something like that, right? Like, whatever your process is, um, what all we're suggesting here is to just maybe make this another part of your process, right? Is that, you know, maybe what this does at the end of the day is either it highlights a guy that maybe you should go back and have some more attention on if if you're a film guy and they come out high from a score perspective you know maybe go back and, and take a second look um or if you're high from them from an analytics perspective and maybe something doesn't match up again it just gives you cause to to go back take a second look um and really just try and arm you with a little bit more information right i think you know, the term I used on the undrafted pod was educated guesses, right? Because like the reality yeah. is when we're drafting these guys, right? Like very few certain guys are, are truly can't miss, right? I mean, you know, there's not many times where we're clicking 101 on like a Bijan or something like that. And pretty much everybody feels comfortable. And, you know, as we saw last year, the player isn't everything, right? Like situation matters as well, right? So um, totally. I do want to to make it very clear that like, look, while this, you know, while we've had some successful hit rates that we'll kind of go through here and stuff like this, by no means are we saying that this is the Bible. Um, this is just saying, look, you know, we worked pretty hard on this. this these are some of the things we, that we found. And, you know, when you look back at, at some of the guys that it may have unearthed a little bit, you know, from that were probably not on people's originals radars. Um, that's something that we got excited about, right? So it's just something to keep in mind here as we get ready to release the 24 class here in a couple of weeks. Um, by no means is it a Bible, but you know, we're really excited for it to drive some conversation. And and after these rankings come out, you know, happy to talk about why some guys landed there and and really kind of jumping off that point, Trav, like what went into the model to kind of do that. Totally. Yeah. No, I love it. And kind of like Think about it as like the the UN score is kind of like the bumpers on the outside of your bowling lane, 
you still yeah. have to throw that ball, right? You still have to throw that ball. And even with the bumpers, sometimes you're only going to knock three pins down, right? Uh, so you really, um, there. it's not all on the model. Some is still on you. And that's a part of you feeling empowered to make those sound fantasy decisions. So make sure you keep it locked with us here at the Undroppables because we're going to be doing that all off season long and through into the season into the years as this model continues to unfold because year over year, I am so stoked to see it continue to unfold, especially with some of the hit rates that we've seen so far. But before I want to, before we talk about those hit rates, Wiz, I do want to just give another shout out to the Patreon because the benefits in there are bumping. The people in there are chatting, especially in the discord. Um, and we recently just today dropped the top 12 from the 2023 class. So a buzzy player from that episode you did with Jax was Puka Nakua because our model has had Puka Nakua post draft with zero NFL context in play as I believe the fourth or fifth in last year's draft fifth. class. So yeah. what we did today for the patrons is we dropped the top 12 in that draft class. We're going to talk about a couple more here and we're dropping some single graphics on the socials as well. So please go sign up for our Patreon. It's the best way to support the brand and you'll get some of those exclu exclusive perks as well. I'm trying to drop episodes early here and there. So uh, loving everything that's happening there. But we could not be more excited about these hit rates, Wiz. Um, it's actually astronomical. And it uh, when you said that we're excited about these hit rates and I hadn't seen anything, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, they're probably pretty good. But, you know, it's probably like your, your standard model that you see here and there. But, like, we looked at them and I saw them and I saw the list of players and it is pretty mind-boggling. So what we're going to do is we're going to break the scores into kind of like tiers, um, but more more so like kind of groupings of player or of scores here. So we're going to start with the 90 plus. Uh, the score goes up to 100. So we'll talk about a few guys that scored in the 90 to 100. We'll talk about the 75 plus, so 75 to 90, also a very juicy tier. And then we'll talk about below that as well, Wiz. So this is going to be extremely fun to dig into, starting with the 90 plus hit rates. This is an interesting one because it's kind of self-explanatory, Wiz. There's only four players in our 180-player sample that have scored a 90 or higher in the UN score. And so just to be clear on that, that 180-player sample is wide receivers from the draft class of 2018 through 2023. Um, so that came out with 180 players, and only four of those scored a 90-plus. So those four players are Justin Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb, Jamar Chase, and Jackson Smith and Jigba. So I think the first three, pretty easy, right? We can knock those ones off the list. Justin Jefferson, yeah. CeeDee Lamb, Jamar Chase are your consensus yeah. dynasty top three wide receivers. Good signs off the top for the UN score. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that 90, 90 plus hit rate whiz? And then uh, I would like to chat a little bit of Jackson Smith in Jigba after, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Travis kind of mentioned it, right? Is that in there's it's really important to put some context behind some of these scores because i think you know one one of the things that travis mentioned earlier was that you know typically we look for all right like got to be at least you know 85 plus or 90 plus for us to what we want to consider good right but um given that we kind of scaled this out you know justin jefferson it's it's basically scaled off of justin jefferson right he was the we wanted to put some a little bit more clarity around this. Um, so Justin Jefferson was the highest scoring wide receiver in this model. Um, and then basically we scaled up, up, up to a hundred off of Justin Jefferson. Right. So I think, look, having three out of four of those guys, you know, land one, two and three in dynasty right now um, was something that got us again, it's really exciting to see that it's unearthing some of the guys down low that maybe would have been off some radars, but then unearthing, you know, making sure that that top tier is not coming in with too much noise. Right. So I think to your point though, Trav, one of the guys is that JSN, right? What do we do with a guy like JSN? Um, I think by all accounts, right. What he kind of went out there and was able to accomplish or in some cases lack thereof his rookie year left a, quite a few people wanting more. Right. Um, and I think temp, expectations were probably started started to temper a little bit on draft night right like going somewhere behind somewhere like uh dk metcalf and tyler lockett is probably not a place where a rookie wide receiver is really kind of set up to thrive even though you know geno smith had had done some really nice things that year prior but i think what this speaks to is look from an analytical perspective um what he did at ohio state not just like not just the on-field production, but also what he was able to do like while 
Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson were there, like yeah. it would some of that overlap was just, and look, yes, he had CJ Stroud thrown to him, who is clearly an elevator, which we've seen him do in college and now at the NFL. So, you know, there is some of that to take into account, but um, it, it's, it's tough. The way Trav, we were talking about this yesterday and kind of preparation for this episode is what do you do with a guy like JSN right now? Right. So I think the way I look at this and this goes, this is kind of starting to speak to some of the actionable advice that can potentially come out of using something like this. Right. Is that what I would do um, personally, and I have done this in a couple spots is start checking in on JSN owners and seeing what their current temperature is. Right. Like, because if there's an opportunity for us to, to buy let's call it low, right? Like depending on what that person's temperature is or, or whatever to buy somebody that, you know, is above a 90 scale in this that we've seen, if you're above a 90, like, you know, you've got some great seasons ahead of you. So if we're able to get a discount on a guy like that, it's, it behooves the manager to at least check in, right? Like all you're doing is due diligence. We're not, this is not saying you must go out and buy JSN, but I think what this is doing is saying, look, this is a guy that tested really, really high. There may be a window here, and he's probably getting an upgrade from an offensive coordinator perspective as far as utilization, right? You know, Trav, I think one of the things that we talked about was that OC coming in from UW, right? And Mm -hmm. really, those three wide receiver sets, we should see a much deeper average depth of target for JSN in this new offense as opposed to kind of what we saw last year. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm really excited for that offense, especially, like you said, offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb. Came over after two years with the Washington Huskies in the Pacific Northwest. High-powered offenses, like you said, 11 personnel galore. We want that for this wide receiver group. And I think for Jackson Smith and Jigba, it's interesting because like, I was talking at the top there when we were explaining how to use these thresholds and saying like the 90 90 plus, those are the ones where you're dead certain on. Well, JSN might be um, a good case to say that even in the 90s, we want to make sure we bring that context in for those players, right? Because if we would have looked... We might not have necessarily downgraded JSN for the long term too much because we would have seen that at least for the short term, he's got DK and Tyler Lockett in front of him on that depth chart. He was on a very run heavy offense. And so I think his um, I don't even it's not even a miss, right? His lackluster rookie season, let's say there's reasons for that. There's justification. And so, yeah, for me, kind of like what you were saying there. If a player's still within his first three seasons and he scored really high on the UN score, you're going to look to buy low for that guy because there's a, still a really good chance that he's going to hit for one of those top 24 seasons. Um, and even if I if I have a guy, maybe that tells me I want to hold this guy when I got offers coming yeah. at me, right? Because if you can see that a, a very highly drafted player scored well post-draft capital and now their v- value's a little bit dipped because of some outside factors, not adjacent to their talent or their skill or their potential i think we need to attack and this can help us do that with so i like how you kind of laid that out there yeah no i mean i i totally agree and and look i think just to kind of tie off jsn here a bit i think he's mm-hmm. in a position right now where if i'm if i have him currently i'm likely holding because yeah. most people out there right now are kind of doing what, what i'm doing myself and looking to see if you can get a discount anywhere right so i'm not in the business of of selling him at a discount just yet i'd like to see what that exposure looks like in that new offense before we go ahead and do that totally totally and that dip in value is so realistic with the re-signing of tyler lockett um depending on what your league mates opinions of sam howell who looks to be the newly inserted starting quarterback in Seattle. I actually think that's kind of a good thing because he's got a little bit of gunslinger in him. Um, But you never know what your league mates might think. So make sure you're attacking some of that stuff. I think that's good for the 90 plus tier. Like we said, only four players whiz. I hope it's okay for me to say, stay tuned to Undroppables content because once the 2024 class locks in, we may or may not see a couple names up in that tier. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Um, I know we haven't released the secret sauce yet, so I hope I didn't just spill any beans there. Brother. No, no, I think <laughs> I think it's safe to say there's a couple wide receivers that yeah. uh, everybody probably knows that are going to be scoring pretty high on this thing. So, yeah. Hashtag good at football, as they say. Yes, as they say. Yes. Uh, okay, Wiz, I think the next like threshold, I guess like we can call it, is probably the one that gets me the most excited because it kind of like it's a big it's a bigger group. Um, yep. And this is where our history of looking at grading systems has to differ a little bit right so this is the 75 to 90 group and in our model the un score that is still a phenomenal phenomenal score 
to score 75 or better. Whereas in yep. real life, like if I'm in grade nine and I score a 75, that's like a C plus <laughs> or whatever. Uh, mom's probably not going to be thrilled, but it's passable. You know what I mean? A bit of a different story for the UN score. Um, and I hope you could talk a little bit about these hit rates, because whenever I hear anything in the neighborhood of like 90 percent or 90 plus percent, it's basically pants right off with. So why don't <laughs> yeah. you talk a little bit about these 75 plus hit rates and then we'll talk about some of the players within. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, again, let's go back to the sample size that we've used, right? So we've got 180 wide receivers drafted, um, you know, from the 2018 class through 2023 last year, right? So when we look at that 75 plus and up that Trav kind of had mentioned there, we've got 17 players coming in there, right? So this is anybody above a 75, right, is essentially in that 90th percentile, right? So that's where I think Trav is, and I think it's a really important point to hammer home is that while it may be coming in at a 75 and that's not something that we're used to rel like regarding as a highly rated score, a 75 in our model right now, right. With, with the amount of players that have been run through is 90th percentile. So that's, it's, it's pretty fucking good, right? Like that's something that, you know, we should be, if you've got guys hitting there, let's pay attention sort of area. Right. So um, out of those 17, the only two guys that we've kind of actually, I mean, really there's only one over 75, um, that I think most people would classify as let's call it a bust. Um, and even then he kind of shined a little bit, at least for one season, right? He did. He does have a top 24 wide receiver season under his belt. Uh, that individual is Jerry Judy, right? So, um, but some of the other guys, Trav, I think you and I were talking about this before the show. Um, some of the other guys that are interesting around that spot are somebody like George Pickens, right? So I think there's been a lot of movement in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, not only from an offensive coordinator, a new offensive coordinator coming in and Arthur Smith, um, you know, Kenny Pickett being traded, uh, to the Philadelphia Eagles and then Deontay Johnson also getting shipped out to Carolina. Right. So really, what does this mean for somebody like George Pickens? Um, I think the initial thought is at least looking at the sentiment on Twitter and everything like that, um, is that there, this means more opportunity for somebody like George Pickens, um, I think with Russell Wilson coming in and Arthur Smith coming in as the OC, it's just he's somebody that I would temper expectations on a little bit, you know, but also, look, he's a 90th percentile guy that could be coming into more opportunity. So he's somebody that I would keep an eye on um, as far as his ability to pop. Um, I think one of the things that it, it went into this model, right, and is is probably one of my more probably one of the metrics that we've relied on a little bit the past few months is to kind of get some differentiation between these guys is like first downs per route run. Right. And I think, mm -hmm. um, shout out, shout out Ryan Heath. I just saw him do some nice stuff on some of the NFL guys, um, from this perspective, but you, you do see some of those guys carried over from college to the NFL. Right. And some of the first downs per route run stuff with Pickens in college really has not translated um, or it has translated into the NFL at that low rate. Right. And I think one of the things that Ryan was mentioning was George Pickens is kind of a big play merchant, right. To, to yeah. borrow that term from Ryan. And, and that's one thing that when we're thinking about production here for something like 2024, um, just be wary of that, right? Is that I don't necessarily think this is a George Pickens to the moon situation just because yeah. Deontay was traded and we've got a new OC coming in. But it's, I, I think, look, there's reason for optimism, but at the same time, look what just happened with kind of Drake London being under Arthur Smith there. So again, somebody to keep an eye on if you can get a discount somewhere. I think he's coming in right at around, you know, keep trade cut value around 27 right now, uh, wide receiver 27. So um, Trav, what are your thoughts on somebody like George Pickens right now? Yeah, well, I think like some of the signs around him at this point are looking pretty good, right? Like we, yeah. A, I instantly like that he scored over that 75 because I think it's like 21 of 22 players, 75 plus have had at least a top 24 season in their first three. So we like that for Pickens. I've been kind of like not super sold on him previous to this just because presence of Deontay, presence of a shitty passing game. So I think my arrow is probably pointing up on Pickens, but I don't know if it's up to like the top 12 levels necessarily, just because that Arthur Smith offense could go either way for me, to be completely honest. I think with that run heavy passing attack or uh, run heavy attack that he's going to have, we could see a very condensed target tree yeah. in Pittsburgh and a heavy majority of that could be going to George Pickens. Calvin Austin is kind of that deep threat guy. Of course, Patty Fryer Tud, I like to call him is a threat in the red zone. But I think Pickens, if things stay as they are, 
can be that alpha and can give you that because he's a guy like you give him 95 targets and with that big play merchant style could give you 1312 or something like that you know what i mean so i don't think yeah. he's a guy who needs 140 plus necessarily so i think 120 is definitely within his realm of possibilities for the steelers this year only worry for me is that they draft high another wide receiver because the receivers in this yeah. class are really good um and like with that big play merchant style, if they get somebody that's a little bit more versatile, that can stick maybe a little bit better than some guy who just got shipped out to Carolina, um, then that guy's going to be a real threat to George Pickens if he brings more versatility than does George Pickens. So my only concern, but I would say top like top 16, 18 wide receiver right now in Dynasty for sure, because the upside is massive. Yeah, I mean, look, I agree with you. I think the one of the things that we probably do need to keep a serious eye on from because i i'm in agreement i think there's probably a pretty condensed target tree there right now um so adding somebody whether it's first round draft capital or even you know high second because i think there's a lot of receivers that fall into the kind of that second round area as well i just worry that any sort of big time addition there whether it's first or second round almost takes enough away where he just have to be so incredibly efficient um in order to kind of return that season that some people are hoping for um, just because I don't think the, the necess necessarily the volume is going to be there. Right. So, you know, if they don't add somebody and, you know, he's somewhere in that range of that 110, 120 range that you had kind of mentioned, Trav. Yeah, sure. Great. But if they do add somebody and, you know, now you start kicking that down to whether it be a hundred, you know, or 110 or something like that, the efficiency that he's got to have to kind of, you know, give, give back on some of that ranking slash value is just something I'd worry about a little bit, but. Totally. Yeah. Like at that point, he has zero room to not be a big play merchant. Basically, he yeah. has to do it at a ridiculous rate. I think another feather in his cap for being able to do that potentially is yeah. those two quarterbacks that they brought in. Um, give a, I do want to give a shout out to Marcus and BZ on Steelers Uncovered. They just put out, we just dropped it, I think yesterday. Um, we're dropping so many shows. I can't keep track of when they're dropping, which is a good problem to have. Um, but BZ and Marcus did an awesome breakdown of the Steelers free agency move. So I'm not going to go like too deep into that or whatever, but, um, I think Russell Wilson and Justin Fields can both be really good for him as far as continuing to make those big plays. Russell Wilson last year with Denver, um, had Cortland Sutton, obviously, and a little bit of Mar Marvin Mims, but we'll get there. Um, Russell Wilson was had the 11th highest deep throw percentage last year with uh, with Sean Payton, which is pretty solid considering Sean Payton's history. The two seasons prior to that in Seattle, Russell Wilson was a top three deep thrower as far as deep throw percentage. So I think some of that's baked into him. And basically the only place that Justin Fields was a good thrower last year was deep to DJ Moore. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think some of that stuff could come into play very nicely for George Pickens. But then you also got Calvin Austin coming into play too. So not sure what to make of it. Just don't shy away from Pickens because the upside could be nice, but just take a peek at the guys are, that are around him in whatever drafts you're doing or whatever it might be. If it's a trade offer, um, you know, see what you can get. Real quick, that's the second Calvin Austin reference we've heard, and we're yes, about 33 okay. minutes in here. So is it safe to say that he's one of your favorite guys and he's been on your some of your dynasty taxis for a little bit? Yeah, I, go, I caught him on some taxis, got him on some taxis. Also, my former co-host was a, is a diehard Steelers fan, and him and I talk all the time about uh, football and whatnot, and we get into some good Steelers and Eagles talk, of course. Um, sure. So I kind of like have this like little bit of rooting for the Steelers for whatever reason which is so odd being the other Pennsylvania team um but yeah like I keep keep tabs on that stuff and that Steelers wide receivers thing while it's kind of cooled off a little bit as of late I still keep my eye on those Steelers wide receivers because they come out of nowhere so uh definitely some upside to be had especially now that they have an actual quarterback yeah absolutely Okay, next on the list, uh, we're going to actually uh, piggyback a couple of guys together because one guy who scored very nicely in this within this threshold of the score is Hollywood Brown, who just moved from Arizona over to Kansas City. Hollywood's score post-draft capital back when he was drafted was 79.38. And his new teammate, Rushi Rice, actually, we just dropped a graphic this morning of him showing his score of 74.05. So very dynamic wide receiver room in Kansas City, which almost to me starts to signify a transition away from Travis Kelsey being the centerpiece. Not that either of these guys are going to be the full centerpiece while he's there, but they're starting to look at life after Travis Kelsey potentially. Um, so what, like, 
What do you think this Chiefs offense looks like with these guys? And what's your stance on Hollywood Brown? Because he's had a bit of an up and down career going from Baltimore to Arizona, now to Kansas City. Looks like wheels are up though, eh? Yeah, I think, you know, wheels up is probably a pretty fair statement. I think it's it really it's going to be health related, Trav, right? Because I think yeah. we saw you know, what he's able to do with a guy like Kyler Murray in those first kind of five, six games before Kyler ended up getting hurt uh, and tearing his ACL the year prior. Um, we we saw what he was kind of able to do there, right? I think he was wide receiver six through week five um, of that season. So with a gifted thrower being, you know, kind of, let's call it, this is where the conversation is going to lie, right? Like, does he have the ability to out-target Rasheed in somebody like that offense, right? Like, I think Kelsey's probably still the king of the castle when it comes to targets. Um, but what does the target competition look like? I do think that initially, I thought there would probably be a little bit of overlap, right, with kind of some of the things that they do well, whether it be, you know, I think they're both kind of slant guys, um, kind of a little bit initial thoughts were the way that Hollywood's been used a little bit more recently um, was that shorter kind of middle of the field stuff, which is where we saw Rashid thrive last year. Right. But yeah. I got to think that the way that the chiefs are thinking about this is kind of getting Hollywood back to his little bit of his deep prowess ways, right? Like pushing the ball mm -hmm. downfield a little bit more. And if that's the case, it probably, it probably makes them much more difficult to pl game plan for right i think yeah. a so much of their stuff when you look at them last year whether it was travis kelsey or rasheed rice so much of their stuff was done within like seven yards of the line of scrimmage and like mm -hmm. just thinking about the kansas city chiefs and um you know kind of how they've operated those last couple of years it was it's it's an adjustment as a viewer kind of looking at something like that right after watching them push the ball down the field with somebody like tyreek and and everything like that but i think it's look it speaks to the fact of of how good andy reed is with working with what he has um but i yes. think what this does is is look you know when you look at where hollywood brown came in um really strong guy came in at 14th overall at you know with a score just under 80 in the model right so you're talking like you know, 93rd percentile right around mm -hmm. there, you know, 92nd percentile, um, which is, it, look, it's, it's a great score. Um, we've seen him be productive with a good quarterback in the past. I think if you're an owner right now looking at Hollywood Brown and looking at Rasheed Rice, what are you kind of hoping for? You're hoping for Hollywood to unlock some more for Patrick Mahomes downfield, which in effect will open up some more underneath stuff for Rasheed mm -hmm. Rice. Um, that's kind of the way I see it, Trav. I don't know what you have as far as initial thoughts, but I do think there, I do think there's room for both of them to coexist and not only coexist, but I think they do can do some different things and, and thrive there together. Yeah. And I think the key to their coexisting is Hollywood's versatility really, because yeah. both of those guys and Travis Kelsey are dynamite out of the slot. Like both of them are really good. Those receivers, Rasheed Rice made his hay a lot out of the slot last year, doing it after the catch and stuff like that. He moved around too, though. Hollywood, even back to his Baltimore days, like when he was in Baltimore, he was taking deep shots from the slot at like an insane, insane rate. So he can do a ton of different things from different places on the field. I do think he's going to make his bread downfield because Rashi Rice came on strong last season. Might be a bit of a selfish take because I am a huge Rashi truther. Uh, but I really, that's kind of what I'm seeing is, yeah, they'll eat into each other by moving around a little bit, but they're going to operate in a little bit different areas of the field. And they can be interchangeable in other areas of the field as well, where they can both operate separate from each other and i think the presence of travis kelsey only helps that right so i'm really yeah. excited for this offense i think we're not going to see that ultimate ultimate top 10 breakout from rashi rice potentially but those were our expect expectations for him going into last year right i think coming into 2024 without hollywood brown we'd be looking at okay top 12 is in his range of outcomes in fact the first best ball draft that i did this offseason, I took Rashi Rice at 21 overall um, just because I wanted to get some stacking opportunities to come off of sure. that. So it's uh, yeah, it was high prices and that probably works out to be not a great return on the investment for that pick. But those were the expectations for him previous to the season. They weren't that. So if we just bring ourselves to some middle ground between pre 2023 and post 2023, I think he can yeah. still meet those expectations. You know what I mean? So love me some Rashi. Yeah, I think, I mean, really, look, you know, shout out Grimberg. I think he does a fantastic job with some of the Chiefs Uncovered stuff as well. Yes. Um, you know, so I would be curious to hear whether it's in the comments or anything like that. 
the way I look at this is is almost like a basketball team, right? What they've done is they've gone out and got a three point shooter and somebody like Marquise mm-hmm. Brown, and and now they're able to kind of give themselves more space to operate, right? Like get out of that condensed area, and if anything, that should allow them to push that ball down the field more. Um, you know, being tr- absolutely honest here, somebody as like I was somebody that maybe had some reservations about Rashid's production profile, um, just because of that kind of historically low A dot. I do Mm -hmm. think this is ultimately like while it does maybe cap his ceiling from a straight up volume perspective and and everything like that, I do think this gives them an ability to potentially expand his route tree a little bit more and maybe Mm -hmm. take that a dot from something like a like a 5.2 that it was his rookie year here. And can he push that into the six, seven range and work himself into more of an Amon Ra type role and get down the field a little bit more? Because if we're talking comps or something like that, you know, there may be a potential comp that we have found in the model where, right, just a little tease there. But um, yeah, I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see what this does for kind of the next step is, of Rashid's evolution for a receiver for that team. Yeah, yeah. And Yak's the name of his game, right? So that extra two yards on his average depth of target goes a long way when you consider the yeah. yards after the catch that he accumulates. And that this offense kind of allows for its pass catchers to get, right? Like Andy Reid's offense is, I think it's second to only the San Francisco 49ers over the last few years as far as yards accumulated after the catch. So nice little talk there the last guy and we won't spend too much time on him as well but i wanted to um kind of highlight him a little bit because he falls in this threshold he scored a 74.06 0.01 higher than mr rashi rice but he's a guy whose fortunes could potentially change coming up in 2024 and that is jahan dotson of the washington going commandos whiz it's been kind of a, a turbulent first couple seasons for Dotson after being that first round yeah. wide receiver. We know he has Terry McLaurin on that depth chart with him. I think Terry McLaurin is kind of having another resurgence could coincide really nicely with all of this Jahan Dotson talk that we're having too. But what's your stance on Jahan Dotson? And do you think that this score being what it is and then thinking about the context around him in Washington with the potential of he's about to get a brand new quarterback are you holding Jahan Dotson for the future or would you, um, and like getting out right now is you're getting out for nothing. So it's kind of hard. So yeah. it's almost like holding with confidence because you're ready to start him, or holding and waiting for him to do something so you can get rid of him almost, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a great question, Trav. And it honestly, this is where some of, you know, how do we use this model from an actionable pers- perspective? This is where this really starts to come into play. I think the way I look at him is if I own him right now, I'm not selling him just because unless look, if you can use him as a sweetener with somebody like, you know, say you take like a Jaden Reed and a Jahan Dotson, right. And that, and try to tear up to somebody like, let's call it like a tank Dell or something like yep. that. Right. Like um, that's somewhere where I'd be comfortable moving him. But a lot of times if you're trying to move Dotson right now for just Dotson, um, you're basically selling at the absolute bottom here. So yeah. um, I know it's a guy that, you know, Matt Harmon hasn't totally bailed on yet. Um, and look, he was a first round pick a year ago. I think when you look at the commanders last year, um, it wasn't just Dotson that struggled. Um, you know, we saw Terry McLaurin really kind of have a tough yeah, time there bad. as well. Honestly, I mean, shout out Curtis Samuel, the new Buffalo Bill. Um <laughs> frustrated fantasy managers everywhere kind of taking all the work from you know terry and dots in there but look i think he's probably dirt cheap in most owners eyes right now because he's a roster clogger for many people and i don't think anybody right now can say with any sort of confidence that look i'm there's probably gonna be a time this year where i'm gonna start Jahan dotson right so if that's the case and you can go and get out for or you can go grab him for like a late third or something like that i'm not totally opposed to it um Look, it it also depends on kind of who they take, right? I think, you know, if they if somebody like Drake yes. May came in there, I'd probably have a little bit more confidence than maybe somebody like a Jaden Daniels. Um, yeah. but look, I think he's a guy that he he's in that 90th percentile kind of or just under it that we talked about. Um, I think he he did enough his rookie year where he flashed as a nose for the end zone that we have seen when look his sophomore year was brutal. I'm not discounting that we've, we've seen the numbers of like what that does from a sophomore year perspective for wide receivers. I just think the risk reward on somebody with him right now, um, his price being so dirt cheap. He's somebody I'd at least check in on. Totally. Totally. And if you're thinking of back of the third round, like 
and you're looking at like a replacement wide receiver that you might be getting, you're basically going to be getting a first round pedigree wide receiver who's been in the NFL for a couple of years with mixed results over potentially like a third or a fourth round pick rookie wide receiver, depending on how many of those guys fly off the board on day two, right? So I think the trade-off can be nice there if you're looking mid to late third to try and acquire Jahan Dotson because the arrow can only point up, even for me, Wiz, if Jaden Daniels goes there, the needle's still pointing up. You know that I'm yeah. going headlong into some Jaden Daniels this offseason. But yep. I like that take, though, because he is a lot more risky, not only for passing efficiency, but potentially for that team's passing volume, right? If Jaden yep. Daniels is there, we would expect a little bit more run heavy. So really nice way for us to polish off that kind of... Um, that's You know, it's funny is 74.06. He didn't even fall into our 75 plus threshold, but that's okay because I wanted to talk about him anyway, Wiz. Yeah. Me too. Because we wouldn't have hit him in this next tier because we're actually going to talk about the 60s to 70s. Yep. The reason I want to talk about these guys is because it is a big group. 44 players, I believe it is, um, if I can count cells in Excel correctly. Um, but this is where you find guys like Michael Pitt, Michael Pittman Jr., Debo Samuel, Jaden Reed hits like that. But you also find guys like Rashad Bateman, Traylon Burks, guys like uh, Brian Edwards. That was a hilarious draft season when he was coming in. But like we said, like we, we want you to use the UN score as a guide and trust in yourself. So me showing those hits and those misses is just to say, like, it doesn't do all the work for you. Like we've reiterated, yeah. reiterated a bunch of times. So before we get into these players here, how are you? How are you kind of approaching guys that fall into this range whiz? Is there um, is there like a mini threshold within or would you do kind of like what I said? Maybe these are the guys you're digging way more into that context on. So I do think there is like a mini threshold within that 60 to 70 range, Trav. Um, and I, Jax and I talked a little bit about it um, on the undrafted, but I think anything over that 65 range or, or at least close to it um, definitely provides if you go above that, there's definitely some more hits in the 60s than there is below it, right? So if we do want to call like a mini threshold within that, because some of the guys, right, like I think Trav mentioned it, just about 44, 45 guys fall into that 60 to 70 range, right? Which is crazy. When you think about that, that's almost 25% of the entire sample, right? So it's, it's probably just about 20% of the entire mm -hmm. sample. And it's just some names in there to kind of give you guys some context, right? So, um, so guys above 65 falling in that sample, you've got Josh Downs, just under 68, Rashad Bateman, the Trav mentioned, just under 67, Traylon Burks, just under 67, uh, Jaden Reed coming in at 66 and a half. You've got Henry Ruggs, just under 66, Debo, 65.73, and Pittman, 65.73. Uh, and then you got Marvin Mims kind of right on that line at 65.2 and Zay Flowers, 64, um, 63, 63, actually. But that's, I, I think when you look at it here, this is where it's really important, Trav, to kind of, there's less certainty as far as, as hits, right? Like clearly yeah. that's, that's obvious as we start to move down this list. And I think this is where it becomes really important to make sure that this is where your process is, is well-rounded, right? Like this is where, look, this list is not going to give you all the answers and this is where this is when it's time to whether it's you feel more comfortable going back and looking at film on some of these guys. Right. So mm -hmm. the way I would have thought about this is, all right, you know, obviously we didn't know this going into last year. But if there's a group of guys in here, you maybe pick out some ones that like like a Josh Downs, right, who, who really kind of had a lot of buzz last year coming in towards, you know, that 70 range of what we see to, towards wide receivers. Jaden Reed, a guy that, you know, J.J. Zacharyson had talked about kind of going into last year's class. I think what it does is, again, highlights guys to maybe go back and take a second look on. And again, to, to use your phrase, Trav, it's a nice guide, right? So this is something that I think when you look at some of the hit rates in here, we're not even probably at 50% um, in here. But what it is doing is it is still when you look at about 65 and up, you're still up probably at about 50, 60% hit rate there, right? And so that's where I think understanding what your process looks like as far as 
how do I get from, I kind of like this guy based on the UN score to this is a guy that's now a draft target for me because I just went back and looked at what he did at, you know, for Jaden Reed, what he did at Michigan state, right. His, Mm -hmm. his versatility there, they, you know, the design touches of them, of him trying to get the ball, you know, from a rushing perspective as well as receiving perspective, something like that bodes well for the future. Right. So I think Trav, that's one way you could look at some of these guys that as you move down the tiers here is making sure that your process is kind of taking all factors into account and not just a score. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, that's when I would be taking that score. And then not only would I be maybe looking at some tape, I would also be looking at the NFL situation that they got drafted into, right? What is that team's rush to pass ratio historically? What's that new offensive coordinators rush to pass ratio? Where's I call it lucrative opportunities whiz. So what is the red zone target share look like? What is the red zone rushing pie look like? What is the deep targets look like? You know what I mean? So we can use some of that to take a glimpse into some of the usage on top of that draft capital that these guys are going to have. So um, you touched on a couple of guys in that list that we wanted to talk about here Wiz. So I'm going to rearrange us on the show sheet a little bit, but I know that you're good at working on the fly. We're going to talk about Marvin Mims. His score was a 65.2. So still in that 65 plus that we like. Um, but the context around him is he went to a team with a new coach bit of a head case coach and Sean Payton, to be completely honest with you. He went onto a depth chart with Cortland Sutton and Jerry Jaggy on it and a team that wanted to run the ball with Javante Williams and Jaleel McLaughlin, who was a nice little surprise, as well as a little bit of Samaje P. Ryan sprinkled in as well. So what's your stance on Marvin Mims and his long term? Because I'll be honest with like last off season, I wasn't really doing much prospect scouting. So I was taking a little bit of time away or whatever. And so I didn't really dig into these guys to have like those attachments to them or whatever, or have any pre-existing opinions. So why don't yeah. you tell me about Marvin Mims and then maybe what you think of his future going forward, especially now that Mr. Jaggy is no longer there. Yeah, no, it's honestly, I think the way I look at Mims is, really, really great analytical profile, right? Like, I think there's something to be taken into account that look, some of that, a lot of like his production is big 12 production, right? So I do, and that's something that we've adjusted for. And and as we kind of went through the the modeling and testing and correlation process is something that, you know, we've kind of accounted for during that. Um, But when you look at somebody like Scott Barrett, who, you know, we love and somebody that's super respected in the industry, he was a Marvin Mims guy as well, right? Like there's, he, Marvin Mims for, you know, his ability to kind of make explosive plays um, at his size and just really kind of be a threat to take it to the house. Like anytime he really touches the ball and you kind of saw that with the, with the kick return that he had there in his rookie season, you know, this, this guy has juice with the ball. And I think the thing that I keep going back to with Marvin Mims, right. Is if he was drafted by, let's say he was drafted by a different regime before and Sean Payton had come in after the fact, I would be much less inclined to have a, optimistic outlook on somebody like Marvin Mims. Yeah. But it's really important to remember that this is the fucking first guy that Sean Payton traded for. And it's, you really think that with trading away Judy, he's going to probably have every opportunity to to succeed. Right. Like I I think they finally, I think they finally realized that like, look, you know, if, if Sean doesn't utilize him again correctly, he's really got nobody else to blame for him, but himself. Um, Hard to imagine them taking a quarterback there in the first round. Honestly, hard to, or sorry, a wide receiver there in the first round. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, and honestly, they've got tons of holes all over that team. So really, like, Cortland Sutton's great. Sure, I, I he's a great jump ball guy. But like, I don't think we're seeing ten touchdowns again from Cortland Sutton this year with Russell Wilson not throwing it up to him like that. No. So I think I think they're going to give Marvin Mims every opportunity to, su- to succeed. And if that's the case, Trav, like, why not check in on a guy like him right now? I think there are probably some savvy managers out there who have maybe done the math already that, look, that's probably going to happen. So maybe his price has increased a little bit. Um, But he's he's one of those guys like if you're trying to get a deal done and you're looking for a sweetener and, you know, right now it's it's draft pick season. So nobody wants to really throw in draft picks. Maybe see if you can get Marvin Mims as a throw in or a sweetener, um, you know, in a deal or something like that. Where are you at with somebody um, like Marvin Mims? So I just want to touch on that as well. I think definitely moving to Marvin Mims off of an older asset is something I might be trying to do. Like if I have like a DeAndre Hopkins or something, trying to move from DeAndre Hopkins, who people still see as being able to get some production right now in 2024 versus Marvin Mims, where there might be a little bit more questions, uh, I would be definitely making, I would probably trade DeAndre Hopkins for Marvin Mims straight up right now. No problem. Like I think that would be a reasonable trade to make in a dynasty league just because of the age. 
sure, DeAndre Hopkins can give you 10 touchdowns next year with the Tennessee Titans or whatever team. He, I think he's still signed with the Titans, right? Yeah. I can't even yeah. fucking remember anymore. But yeah, um, yeah, a trade like that is something that I'd be doing for him. So I'm totally with you, right? I love everything that you're saying. And regardless of the tumultuous first season in Denver for Sean Payton, we know that he has been able to distribute the ball to his playmakers before. And so only thing that worries me, and it's obviously the elephant in the room for them right now, is who's playing quarterback. Because yeah. Jarrett Stidham is currently the starter, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Lots of talk about them maybe getting a Bo Nix at 12th overall. Um, I mentioned on the last show with Joe that that feels a little bit reachy, but if you got to get your quarterback, you got to get your quarterback. And I do think he fits nicely into that timing offense that Sean Payton does like to run with all those dump offs to the running back. But I do worry a little bit about what Bo Nix might do to the upside of both receivers, to be completely honest with you, if he's maybe not hucking it deep like he should. Um, but even though, even so, like, I don't think it's, I don't think it would be much worse than what Russell Wilson was given last year. You know what I mean? I think like to yeah. your point, it's going to be dispersed a little bit more broadly as opposed to just a lot going to Cortland Sutton. So I like Mims, well, and especially at that cost, you have to smash. And look, I think what we were frustrated with last year was the fact that, you know, there was a lot of overlap between what Judy was running and what Mims was running, which is why Judy ended up, they were fine moving on from him, right? And I think when you look at if that role that they were kind of both not even splitting, right, or if that role they were both sharing is really condensed down to one player and that one player is Marvin Mims who's truly given the opportunity. I think his current price tag right now supports that, you know, potential level of production that he can give you in a role like that, right? So. Yeah, no, for sure. And if you look at the two players, like Jerry Judy is not necessarily the downfield speed threat that Marvin Mims is. So he should not be playing yep. that same role. Uh, and yeah, I think it, even spurts last year, it was so frustrating. Like every time the guy touched the ball, it was electricity and he just never yeah. got on the damn field. Like running like three routes after having a game where he catches two for 95 or something like that. Like, what are you doing? Okay, <laughs> um, Wiz, so... The other guy you mentioned, and actually we mentioned both of these guys, and they are currently teammates. Zay Flowers with his 63.63. Rashad Bateman with a 66.79 coming in higher than Zay Flowers. But I would say so far the early returns on Zay are much more positive than they were on Rashad Bateman. And I think Zay is a really good case of using the rest of your process and incorporating that around the score, yeah. right? Because, yeah, he's under that 65. But take a look at the landing spot that he had. They did not have anybody who does what Zay Flowers does. You know what I mean? He can yep. stretch the field from the slot. He can work crossers from the slot. He can catch shallow passes and take them to the house after the catch. Like he provided something that this team didn't have. And it was very apparent. So I like everything that I've seen from Zay Flowers so far. I still like, I still like Rashad Bateman. And actually, it's funny, another guy that falls in this range is Tyler Johnson. <laughs> Um, yeah. love both of those guys. Tyler Johnson was like a heartthrob of the true North fantasy football podcast, but never panned out. I still think he could have been sick. And I still think yeah. Rashad Bateman with some opportunity could be good as well, but we have to go with the probabilities. And what we know in dynasty is that when you get that deep into your career, as is Rashad Bateman yeah. and your best hope is to change teams and then break out probably should not bet on that happening. But for Zay, it was really encouraging to see the downfield work because early in the season, it kind of looked like he was getting pigeonholed into that lower average depth of target has to be done via yak from the slot stuff. As the season progressed, though, we started to see more deep shots and I loved it. So what's your stance on Zay Flowers and maybe sprinkle maybe a little bit of hope or not for Rashad Bateman after if you got any? No, I think the, the point about Zay that's really interesting and I think is really important to talk about is the fact that we were we did have some worries about him being pigeonholed into a certain role kind of early on, right? There was a ton of designed targets or design touches with him in the beginning that were, you know, really close to the line of scrimmage, right? And, you know, how sustainable is something like that? But then when you look back at the second half of the season, how he did start to, let's not even necessarily expand his route tree, but just get that increased downfield utilization, Um and then to see that, look, I know he had a big time fumble at the goal line in the playoffs, but to see him make that catch down the field in the playoffs when, you know, kind of the chips are down, right? Like that's really, really encouraging. And I think one thing that I go back to where for this group, right, is something that you've kind of mentioned twice now, Trav, and I didn't touch on it before and I really should have, is that this group is really important to understand landing spot, right? Like, because that's, that's where I think that in addition to 
rounding out your process with film on the other side of this, I think really understanding what they're going into from a landing spot perspective and potential for ceiling and, and potential for role and utilization, everything like that is really, really massive, right? Um, because to your point, Zay is a perfect example that look, while he's still in that like 70th percentile or, you know, like 65th percentile within the score, yeah. within the model score, which obviously is not bad, uh, but it's nothing where it's wowing you or anything like that. He was a first round draft pick going into a decent situation, right? So I think it's a really good point about understanding landing spot. And, and that's where it goes back to doing your homework on the NFL side too, like taking back and looking at recent offensive coordinator changes, you know, with like somebody last year, like Todd Monken coming in, like it wasn't your old Ravens offense anymore that you saw with Greg Roman. So understanding certain things like that are, are really, really important when it comes to rounding out the model and using it correctly. So great point there, Trav. The other one, man, I like, look, I still want to say that like, I, I haven't shut the light off for him yet. Like it's dim. Same. Like if there, if this was like the 1700s, right. And there was like a candle, like an oil candle. It was very bright a little while ago, and now I'm just like I'm slowly turning it down. But like yeah. I refuse, I refuse to blow it yeah. out. Um, yeah. And Can't right now it's just candle. really, yeah, it's just it's just really low right now. But like yeah. every once in a while, I want to turn it up because I see, like recently, uh, Jim Harbaugh made some comments that you know Rashad Bateman's going to be a big part of the offense next year, right? Like I think yeah. that was at uh, yeah. that was right before the combine. Sure, right? um, yeah. sure, thanks. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, but then also at the same time, in conjunction with that, I'm seeing him seeing, you know, a couple Twitter videos that are like two and three minute compilations of him running routes in 2023, Baller. generating yards of separation on like multiple different routes. And yeah. it's like, don't do this to me right now. Like I can't like the roller coaster that is Rashad Bateman. I, I look, I think it's somebody that again, he wasn't as high for us as he was for some people. I know that there were some people kind of going back to, you know, after looking back and, and kind of going through some previous ADPs for some of these wide receivers in previous rookie drafts, I know he was quite high up there for a lot of people. Um, and I look, I understand why, like the, the guy flashes, like some of his film is, is really fantastic. And, you know, from a production standpoint, and then when you think about the draft capital, right. Um, but again, he's, he's kind of in that Jahan Dotson zone to me where it's like, look, if he's cheap enough to go by or as a sweetener throw in, like, I'm not saying go out and spend like real assets or real draft capital to go out and get somebody like a Dotson or a Bateman or anything like that. But what I am saying is like, like, look, you could do worse taking a flyer on somebody um, if you want to take a flyer. Right. So uh, he is somebody that like, look, if the price is cheap enough, yeah, sure. I'll take a chance on him for one more time. Right. So that's kind of totally. how I'm looking at Rashad Bateman right now. For sure, man. And I think kind of to your point, like there's different levels of flyer that you're taking, right? I think yes. the potential breakout from Jahan Dotson is way bigger than the potential breakout from Rashad Bateman because we're fairly confident that with Lamar Jackson, that's going to stay a, maybe not a super run heavy team because they improved on that this season with T Todd M Munkin, but they're not going to flip the needle all the way to being just a pass happy no. team because of that offense, right? Rashad Bateman um, is going to be um that's going to be to his detriment a little bit you know what i mean and so maybe if there's still any wick left he can find a new candlestick and that candle that's beside him can share its flame and he can start burning bright once again so yeah. we like rashad bateman and we love zay flowers as well he's super exciting going into year two getting more acclimated into that offense getting more cemented into his role maybe that's a team that's maybe not looking at life after mark andrews but life with mark andrews not being your only focal point because relying too heavily on him in the past has gotten them in trouble so i like yep. all that that we said on the baltimore ravens one more one more player to talk about here Wiz, and he's a guy that we released on x.com with a graphic i think it was yesterday that we did that again there's just so much stuff flying so make sure you're following us everywhere yeah. you can but this guy's interesting because he's kind of a hit in the model with a score of 60.4. Like we said, it's not your mom and dad's model or scale of score. A 60.4 is still a solid score and somebody that you might want to take a look at and start to process a little bit. So this guy is Quentin Johnston, Wiz. I know he's been an interesting one in the group chat that we've been talking about because he's a good little mm -hmm. test case for this. Only one year in. Awful awful rookie season he had his best weekly finish was wide receiver 26 
and he needed one of the only two touchdowns that he scored all season to hit that wide receiver 26 rest of the time. He didn't have a week inside the top 30 for PPR purposes. So not a great rookie season for Quentin Johnston looking towards his sophomore season though, Jimmy Harbaugh comes in the fold and things are starting to look a little bit up for QJ, but it's hard to take the pain of his rookie season away. But then we see that mass exodus of Keenan Allen, Mikey dubs out the door potential for them to draft a running back. They got Gus Edwards. So we know they're going to be run heavy. It's going to have to be a condensed, condensed target tree over here. And it's going to have to go heavily to Quentin Johnston, in my opinion. But what's your take on Quentin Johnston? Like does, what does his 60.40 score do for you? Does that like, are you shying right away from that being under six, under 65? Or do you think you could still be in on the fact that good enough score plus some opportunity coming? Yeah. So I think honestly, with a lot of this stuff, Trav, I think it's, it's really about um, the, the relative cost of the player, right? So if you can go out and you can get a deal on him from somebody that may be frustrated, the problem is, look, we're only a year in and with, with the exodus of Williams and then with the trade of Keenan Allen, a lot of Quentin Johnson owners have now been infused with like this new hope. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess the the argument or the cold water that I would throw on that is Mike Williams missed a ton of last year already, like last year anyways. And Keenan Allen didn't play essentially the last six weeks of the season. Yeah. Um, And QJ still kind of failed to make an impact. Right. And the other thing that, you know, I'd be kind of remiss here is this is something that I've been talking about on on X a little bit is that, look, I think Justin Herbert is a great quarterback. I do like Justin Herbert a lot. I wonder if he's going or about to enter a phase where he's maybe a better real life quarterback than he is a yeah. fantasy quarterback. Um, when you look back at whether it's whether it was his time in San Francisco, obviously Kaepernick there. Yeah. So, you know, there there is some QB stuff there. But when you look at Harbaugh's career, right, like we've we've got a lot of his coaching career and he he's a run heavy guy, right? Like mm-hmm. he's not he's never going to be like one there his offenses are never going to be near the top of the league in pass attempts. Right. And how Herbert was getting home these last couple of years from a fantasy perspective was honestly straight up volume. Um, uh-huh. His, his touchdown to interception uh, or his touchdown efficiency dropped severely these last two years from 2021. And that's just something where if he doesn't get back to 2021 levels, I worry about his ability to kind of support multiple wide receivers. Right. And something like that. So, and look, the, the other factor here is, yeah, they could be relying on Quentin Johnson a little bit, but they're also probably going to, whether it's the first round or not, um, like it, it's kind of hard to see them passing on Malik neighbors and not giving Herbert like that number one option. But I w- also wouldn't put it past Harbaugh to go and take Joe Alton's just build yeah. a ridiculous offensive line. Right. Like, so we just don't know. Um, but one thing I think that, you know, I would have some trepidation on as a Quentin Johnson owner is saying, all right, those guys are gone. It's his time. Like, let's go because those guys were gone like for a decent amount of that rookie year. And we still kind of failed to see him make an impact. And some of the things that people were worried about going into his rookie year with some of the body catching stuff, um, you know, his ability to track the ball downfield. We saw that bear fruit in a bad way in his rookie year. So he's not somebody that I don't think his price is depressed enough right now, Trav, where like you could probably go out and get a steal on him right now. Truth, Yeah. But if you can, then okay, he's he's likely going to get more volume and more opportunities. I'm not necessarily as hopeful on someone like him. Like I've got more hope for John Dotson, honestly, than I do for Quentin yeah, Johnson. Same here. That way. So same here. Yeah, I think you touched on all of that perfectly. Like all of it. Um, that offense and Justin Herbert is going to need to be hyper efficient because I would yeah. say that I am like 90% confident that they're a bottom five passing volume team. No doubt. Um, And then you have to look at like, okay, so with that, there's going to be one receiver and only one receiver that is returning, like are giving you what you need for your fantasy team, right? Like returning on investment. Maybe the second guy returns on investment if he's dirt cheap and he just is there. You know what I mean? But the second guy in this offense is going to disappoint as far as being a reliable flex option for you. Um, so that's kind of my stance on them. And we know that like, we're just attaching to that run game. Uh, maybe Justin Herbert is kind of a stream streamer plus option because he is that talented, but 
where you mentioned Kaepernick, I think Justin Herbert has some rushing upside that's been unlocked or that has not been unlocked a little bit in the NFL. Not that he's going to start run, running all over the field or anything like that, but I think there could be some more mobility in his future if Harbaugh wants to get him moving around a little bit. Because I've always kind of thought that about Herbert. Like a lot of times he's running out of the pocket and he is trying to be a gunslinger still, which has worked out fairly well for him so far in the NFL. But there's a lot of times where it's like, dude, you could fucking run that for 25 yeah. easy. Yeah. Because he's, no, I, I think he's more athletic than he gives himself credit for, you know? Yeah, totally, Trav. And I think honestly, if you're a Justin Herbert owner, um, I think that's what you're looking at as far as how do you supplement the potential decrease in volume right? From a pass attempts perspective, what's the best way to do that is increase his ability or increase his floor from a rushing perspective, right? So I think as a Herbert owner, especially with Greg Roman going there, do they, do they install some, you know, QB designed runs there that maybe take an element of what he was doing in Baltimore with Lamar Jackson? By no means am I saying that Lamar Jackson or that uh, Justin Herbert is going to start running like Lamar Jackson, but can they take a few of those QB designed runs to increase his floor a little bit from a rushing perspective? Because I think if we do start to see some of that, the downside probably isn't as much. And then if he is able to kind of be hyper efficient, maybe then the upside's a little bit higher than I would have initially thought. So it's a, the rushing with Herbert, uh, Trav is a great point. Totally. And, and even though I'm saying that, like I'm not hundred percent confident that it's happening, right? Yeah. Because he's yeah. not the Lamar, he's not the Lamar type. Right. And so no. I think that would probably have to be a bit of a perfect storm for him to be able to uh, adequately supplement that dip in, in passing. So this is just some of that context that we're talking about Wiz. like, we started that conversation on Quentin Johnston. We got down into the nitty gritty of the Greg Roman and Justin Herbert cases and how they might affect this offense. Right. And so that's kind of a part of it. Like to the point of the show, you got to unravel the threat. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got to take nice. that spool nice. that is tangled and you have to pull that apart. And that's what we're going to do here on Unraveled over the offseason. So I want everybody to make sure they keep it dialed, keep it locked. When you see an episode, tune in. Uh, feeling a good flow. This is the second episode we've done this week, Wiz, and I'm fired up about that. And so I'm going to try and keep up a weekly cl clip just because it's really fun getting back in the lab. Sometimes life doesn't permit, but really, really would like to try and do that. And Wiz, I would really love if you were to join me again sometime throughout the offseason if not more often than just sometimes. So man, what do we got here? What, oh yes. We've got the patron question Wiz. So I can't, uh, I oh, can't yeah. leave that out. Yeah. Let's do it. It's just been so fun talking to all these players. And like, I love yeah. how this show shook out because we started talking about those thresholds, but we went into some fantasy takes on some players as well. And so hopefully our listeners have enjoyed that and they got some stuff that they can take away from this show because I speak for myself when I say that it's been a really good time. And so I just hope, for that for all of you as well but with the question that we got from the patreon group um full disclosure sorry to the patreon patrons for throwing this out there so late uh next time i'll try and get a little bit more ahead of asking for your questions um but i think the one question that we did get Wiz is very apt for where we're at in the process of launching the score right uh because we're not like we're not going to be giving away the secret sauce necessarily. We haven't released the 2024 draft class or any of the other draft classes yet. But this question that, um, and let me just find because my computer doesn't show me. Uh, Dexter Lebowski asks us, will there be actionable, actionable advice later? Um, or, okay, sorry, let me. <laughs> will there be actionable advice later? Thinking like how Adam Levitan provides DFS insight to Josh Hermsmeyer's air yards model, love air yards, um, or is that not necessary? Does the model speak for itself? Love it so far. Seems awesome. So that's a sneak peek for anybody listening as to what's happening in the Discord. Like they're asking us questions about this stuff, and we're being honest with them and open, right? Uh, and I think it's really fun to see their reception for it. So if I could, Wiz, I've got a, a little touch answer for that one, and then I'd be happy to pass it to you to give any parting shots on this question here. But as far as the actionable advice around it, I think that's where we come into play, right? That's where you being in tune with the Undroppables platforms comes into play because. We know that Jax is going to be talking about the model. He's already been doing it for like three or four different shows. I edit his video clips. He is stoked for this thing. So you know Jax is going to be talking about the model on Undrafted. And I plan on weaving this within my process throughout the offseason, Wiz. So I'm going to be talking about as much as I can on Unraveled. 
There's also the Patreon. Get in there, get in the Discord, ask us questions, right? And so we, as the Undroppables analysts, are your actionable advice, right? We started that tonight by talking about yeah. how we think you should be using some of these thresholds, where you can be a little bit more certain in the score and where you can still be confident, but you want to do a little bit more digging, right? We can be that actionable advice. And I think Wiz, we might have some other fun stuff coming coming down the pipes that will be kind of adjacent to the score that really just are value adds to the tool that everyone's going to be getting. Um, did you want to just touch on those? Because we might be talking about those down the line a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things, and it's really interesting kind of the way we handled the show tonight, because I do think there is an element of of how we were able to weave in some of the score or model conversation into some actionable advice, right? I don't think that's not exactly how you have to use it from an actual actionable perspective, but what we kind of went through tonight, talking through some players and potential buy lows or, you know, relative cost to acquire players because of previous scores in the model. Um, I think that's definitely one way to use it. Uh, but I think what Trav is referencing here is something that we're really excited about to kind of start to bring to light here over the course of the next three weeks. We're working on some player comp stuff right now. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is really kind of looking at, you know, every player that's kind of gone through the model and looking at, you know, how they comp to other players that have gone through that model. Um, I touched on it briefly earlier as kind of like a little sneak peek. And I did just kind of want to do that. But, you know, when you think about somebody like Rasheed Rice, right, just to give you guys kind of an idea of what we're seeing. Um, I've seen, you know, shout out Debro, shout out Debro uh, on Twitter or X, um, seen him make this comp outside of everything that we're doing is Rasheed Rice and Amon Ra, right? So when, we are kind of going through our process of generating some comps from the model and everything like that for us to see Amon Ra be one of Rasheed Rice's top comps from a strictly analytical perspective and college profile production perspective. That stuff is really excited to see, right? Or exciting to see. So I think one of the things that is really going to help us from an actionable perspective is really starting to release certain comps for players, right? There's, there's, we're looking at anywhere from five to eight comps per player. And it, what it does is kind of gives you a little bit more of an understanding of the potential floor and ceiling for each of these players, right? So that helps you, again, another data point for you to when you're thinking about or evaluating a player or trying to put together a trade of guys to target and thinking about roster construction, about how much risk you want to take on for a certain player. Mm -hmm. um, something like that player comp thing and understanding, you know, potential a little bit deeper about that range of outcomes for each player uh, is something that I think from an actionable advice perspective is really exciting, Trav. Totally, man. Range of outcomes is actually huge for me in my process because like I'm no data scientist or anything, so I can't quite, you know, do the stuff that you guys do. But for me, a lot of times when I'm looking at my dynasty roster, I'm looking at what do I want to get out of the second wide receiver on my team? Ideally, yeah. I want the second wide receiver on my team to have wide receiver one potential, right? And so that's where kind of yeah. range of outcome stuff comes into play. Okay, this guy does have the upside and the situation to be that top 12 option as the second wide receiver on my dynasty roster. Oh, shit. He's got a really high UN score. Keep in that guy or whatever it might be, right? Like definitely different ways to use that. And I love how you brought range of outcomes in there, because I think that is, uh, aside from the data degens, that's some language that people who might not be as deep into it can understand, because we still want them to be using the score as well. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily be a data scientist or a analytics guy like Wiz is yeah. to be able to utilize this model for your process, right? Part of that is, like I mentioned as well, chatting with us we're always available on the socials we're always available in that discord which is definitely the priority um but yeah like use us use us use the yeah. tools use the site use the analysts um not volunteering your twitter or anything whiz but whiz is crushing responding to all the questions that are happening as well as jay the ff coder as well as jack's dino game theory as well as chalk 101 chalk so go check out all those guys on x.com because they have put a ton a ton of work in there shout out to fantasy dukes as well if you see the socials you'll see some dope graphics around the model yeah. shout out to the uncovered squad like i said at the top of the show i think we've got about six teams on boarded the denver broncos will have dropped by the time this show is released go check out the undroppables.com go check out the last episode we had with dino joe talking about some of the prospects that was a good episode as well Wiz, any party, party shots for the people before I ride out here? 
Uh, one of the parting shots would be, Trav, thanks for being a gracious host, my friend. This was awesome to do. Um, it's probably been a, a little bit overdue for us, but um, I felt like, you know, we acquitted ourselves pretty, pretty well here for the first time going through it together. So it was pumped. I'm pumped to be on here, man. And hopefully this is not the uh, the last time anytime here soon. And for anybody watching on YouTube, guys, hope you enjoyed it. And to Travis's point, right, like this is something that we're excited about to kind of share with you guys. So please, questions, comments, concerns, anything like that please be sure to kick them over to us because this is, it's a living, breathing thing right now. And we want to kind of, we want it to come across that way. And, you know, this is not something that we're releasing and saying, that's it. That's final. Um, we want this to drive good discussion and, and be a nice outlet for, for us here in the, uh, the dynasty off season, so to speak. So. Totally. Yeah. We are all about making sure that we are doing what you, the loyal support supporters need. So, Great point there, Wiz. Really appreciate it. Find this man on x.com at DeWiz underscore FFB. Like I said, at the undroppables on all of them. Find me at TSEAL14. This show is unraveled. Until next time, peace.